Howdy, I'm Arthur Falls, and this is the introduction to the Aotearoa Tomorrow YouTube channel and podcast. This first run will be a short pilot series. I'm giving a spoken introduction to explain a bit about the overall idea and what we will hopefully cover, but the episodes will mainly be interviews. The goal is to understand New Zealand, Aotearoa, as a nation explore some of the ways it's being run by the government, but most importantly, the gap between reality and political decision making. By understanding this gap, hopefully we can call out some bullshit and get an idea of what our government should actually be doing. Because it was really hard to know who to vote for this election. In their two terms, Labour hadn't achieved what many of us expected them to do. Uh, National was a mess. The Greens seemed more like the party of wokeism than environmentalism. ACT had so many super complex solutions to everything that ails New Zealand, you had to wonder who had the time to come up with all their wacky schemes. New Zealand First didn't seem to have any policy really at all, apart from slowing immigration, which admittedly is probably pretty on point, but that mixed with a bit of over anti maori racism, which was less necessary. Top and the Māori Party both had some good, reasonable policy, but they can't seem to break through to the mainstream. And then you had uh, Freedom NZ, New Zealand Loyal and the rest, which may seem a bit irrelevant, but some of these eccentric political projects do actually speak to genuinely disenfranchised groups and often raise serious issues that other parties don't. So it's not really fair to write them off as socially irrelevant, even if they are politically irrelevant or not currently politically irrelevant. But no matter what your political leaning, this country is lacking a credible political voice and vision. This lack of vision showed in the policies proposed in advance of the election. Many were unrealistic and detached from a clear political project, but at the same time, the criticism of these policies by other parties or on, in the media was often weak and spurious. National's plan offers a great example of this wishy-washy posturing. Stop Labour's wasteful spending that you're paying for. Get the books in order. Encourage work, reward effort, and let you keep more of what you earn with tax relief. Cut red tape, build infrastructure for growth, like roads and public transport. Drive technology and innovation. Support trade and investment. Grow skills and keep talent in New Zealand. These are slogans that could have just about as easily been used by Labour, who instead went about trying to pork barrel the election with cheap fruit and veggies and free dental care. As a nation, we have some serious issues to deal with and some major opportunities ahead of us, but no one is talking about addressing these in a plausible way. And this is a pity because while working on this project, it surprised me to learn that this country has a wealth of institutions and researchers outside of government working on policy. Some of these people act as individuals, others are employed by universities, business associations and think tanks. I don't understand then why, come election, these experts who work without political affiliation aren't given more media airtime. This series is about using all this free-floating expertise to look at public policy critically. It's not supposed to be persuasive, but there will be natural bias, and as with all biases, you'll notice it in the things that aren't said, so please, if I miss anything, call it out. Before we begin, though, to make the point about why we need to look for policy outside of politics, I think it's important to briefly examine a few issues, how they were discussed politically, and how they actually are. For example, across the board, parties had a bunch to say about crime. Labour, backing our police, keeping our streets safe, going after organised crime, preventing youth crime, accountability for youth offending. National, exactly the same thing. ACT was a bit more firebrand with its 
anti-cuddling policy and calls for tougher sentences and adult justice for youths. The Greens were support and prevention focused. These policies and perspectives are pretty say what you see and unstrategic. National and ACT have blamed Labor for being soft on crime and trying to reduce the prison population. But that's a bit rich when our prisons are already at 94% capacity. This isn't to say that Labor is not too soft on crime, but the connection between harsh sentencing, which National and ACT advocate for in public, and reduce crime rates is complex. The US loves to put people in jail, and a 2014 National Academies paper on what has happened over there could foreshadow New Zealand's upcoming experience. Growth in US incarceration rates over the past 40 years was propelled by changes in sentencing and penal policies that were intended in part to improve public safety and reduce crime. In recent years, policy initiatives to reduce state prison populations have often met with objections that public safety would be reduced. Violent crime rates have been declining steadily over the past two decades, which suggests a crime prevention effect of rising incarceration rates. For the first two decades of rising incarceration rates, however, there was no clear trend in the violent crime rate. It rose, then fell, then rose again. Crime has indeed increased in New Zealand over the past few years, but especially over the last year. This increase was overwhelmingly in property-related crimes, theft and burglary. And that increase coincides with the increased inflation, particularly in food prices, which has caused the cost of living crisis. If we don't solve the cost of living crisis, but instead insist that the solution to crime is more police and prisons, the government is going to create a social class of criminals. As it stands, the only developed nations with higher incarceration rates than New Zealand are the US, Taiwan and Australia. It's worth pointing out that there are almost 9,000 people on the New Zealand national gang list, double what it was in 2016. So we already have a criminal society in this country. Personally, I haven't heard anyone discuss the reason for this growth in gang membership in a way that sounds plausible. Deportation of Australian gang members has been significant, but only accounts for a very small part of that growth. Another poorly discussed issue is public debt. There are two numbers being reported for New Zealand government debt, and I'm referring to percentages of GDP. One includes our superannuation fund, and one doesn't. Most countries would include a fund like this when they calculate net debt. But until recently, New Zealand hasn't. So in 2022, New Zealand could be said to have had 35% debt to GDP ratio or 17. The former is the number that National campaigned on. The latter of the two numbers is more internationally recognised. And again, I'm talking net, not total debt. It's like New Zealand earns 50 grand a year, has a bunch of money in the bank, but owes about 8,500 more than it has in savings. This is after COVID, so for a comparison, Australia's net debt is 42% of GDP. Most countries are pretty close to 100. At the end of 2023, New Zealand is expected to owe the equivalent of 22% of GDP. Labor plan to bring it down over time from there, and so does national. So this is all to say that our national debt is low and both major parties are committed to keeping it that way. They have basically the same policy. And in my opinion, it's a policy that doesn't make any sense. The Infrastructure Commission says that New Zealand has an infrastructure deficit worth $104 billion. The infrastructure group Infrastructure New Zealand, uh, it's a lot of infrastructures, puts that number at over $200 billion. They are an infrastructure industry membership organisation, so we should take their opinion with a grain of salt. But New Zealand's GDP is a bit over $250 billion, so... By the numbers, we could drop $100 billion on roads, rail, shipping, internet, health, education, public transport and water infrastructure over the next few years and still keep our total net debt under 50% of GDP. The country would be completely transformed. Speed limits could go up to 120 on all the main highways. It's a nice idea. 
But what I've described is actually unrealistic because you can't just throw money at a problem like infrastructure. We've spent so little on it for so many years that we don't have an established industry that could deliver on such a scale. We need more equipment and more highly skilled tradies and engineers. Infrastructure development in New Zealand is a complex subject and it's not really what I want to get into here. The point is we have pathologically low public debt and anyone who's making a big deal about how the country owes too much is straight up full of shit. Think about all the other things these people could be talking about. We had a once in a century storm this year. An entire town was washed away. Look at Hawke's Bay from the air. It's totally wasted. Gabriel cost $14 billion in damage. Not just in New Zealand, but mostly in New Zealand. And that makes it the most expensive natural disaster ever to hit the Southern Hemisphere. There are hundreds of major issues that outrank public debt, especially when both major parties agree that they will reduce it. Every time there's an election, the health of the economy becomes a hotly debated issue. It's true. The New Zealand economy is not working well for most people participating in it. But the economy itself is actually really strong and has been for the last 25 years. We are experiencing some turbulence in the aftermath of COVID, but much less than the rest of the world. Annual growth in GDP was 3.2% as of June, which is in line with the past two decades. And it was up 0.9% for that quarter, which is better than all our economic peers, with the exception of Japan. The IRD publishes a lot of cool stuff online, and I found a spreadsheet that lists wage and salary distribution uh, of New Zealanders. This excludes wealth and income from shares and selling property, so there's a lot more money floating around in the higher end of the incomes, but it's useful for understanding certainly what the lower end uh, of income earners are living on. According to the IRD numbers, 27% of wage earners earn less than 26000 a year. That's half of what they call the living wage. 42% of the workforce is earning less than minimum wage on an annualised basis. They say the unemployment rate is under 4%, but nearly half of our workforce is obviously working part-time, more than half probably. It's hard then to say that we really have low unemployment. The living wage, which is higher than the minimum wage, is defined as a level of income that allows individuals or families to afford adequate shelter, food, and other necessities. It's $52,000 a year here, and only 47% of New Zealand workers earn that much. In the presence of such low unemployment, there are two obvious causes that you must assume for these really grim numbers, both of which are probably sides of the same coin. One, the labour market is not effectively distributing money across the wage base, which seems obvious. And two, people would rather live in destitution than work for what they're able to be paid. This is a picture of a wage economy that's not functioning. The lower quartile of rents for a two-bedroom flat, this is just by way of example for what living costs look like, in Stokes Valley, Lower Hutt, which is not a high-income area, is $450 a week. Take-home pay for living wage earners, this is 47% and up, is $42,658. That means two living wage earners living in that flat would be spending 27% of their income on rent. That sounds okay, except when you realise that to get that low rent, they need to be living 10 kilometres away from both Hut Central and Lower Hut, which are the two pl closest places they are likely to be working. Fuel consumption for a 2006 Toyota Corolla is 7.4 litres per 100 k's, so that's an extra $22 per week, pretty affordable on fuel. Tyres and repairs and maintenance, though, are about $800 a year on average. Insurance, maybe $300. Warrant and Rego, an extra hundred. So just to get to work in a car, that's about an extra two and a half grand per year, if you want that cheap rent. Public transport costs the same. Comparable rents in Hut Central and Upper Hut are about 550, which works out the same. But if you live there, you're gonna have a harder time affording a car. 
Either way, you're only going to have about 28 grand left in order to live off. 23 if you spend $100 a week on food, 20 grand if you spend 240 a week on utilities and a phone. So just being operational leaves only about 20 grand left over out of the living wage for clothes, recreation, buying that car if you don't live way out of town, or savings. And if you have kids, things get even tighter. Obviously, there's no possibility of buying a house or making any significant financial investment on this level of income. In other words, no hope. What I've described is the scenario for someone from the 47th income percentile living in the cheapest realistic rent. But 27% of workers earn half that. So my question is, where are all these people living? And you know that it's in cars, vans, sheds, tons of people packed into small houses, squatting, tents. According to the 2018 census, over 100,000 people were considered to live in severe housing deprivation. I can't find a more recent number than that, but it's hard to believe it's gotten any better. The reason I go through all this is to show that there seems to be a large portion of New Zealanders who are not effectively supported by the wage economy. Employers say it's really hard to find workers, but many struggle to pay minimum wage, let alone a living wage. And I'm not ripping on employers, although Labour loves to take credit for increasing the minimum wage when really it's employers who have to pay that. And lots of them have it really rough too. Just because someone runs a business doesn't mean they don't live in some kind of precarity themselves. Many small business owners are just trying to get out of the low wage economy that so much of the country is trapped in. What I find weird is that with the economy pumping so hard, why do employers not have enough money to pay work as well? Where is all the money going? This is the big question we need to answer about the economy, and this is what politicians need to be speaking to. Instead, they dance around the issue. National says they will get the economy working for all New Zealanders, but what they're really saying they'll do is cut wasteful spending, cut red tape, whatever that means, build more roads and public transport, drive technology and innovation, support trade and investment, and grow New Zealand's skill base. There is a degree to which this is all on point. We do need to build high-value industry in New Zealand so that there are more high-paying jobs, and these high-paying jobs require the skill base of the labour force to grow. But 73% of our workforce works in the service sector, the bulk of these jobs are on the lower paying end of the curve. We might add a few high paying jobs by growing advanced industry, but that's not going to make a dent in the million and a half people on less than the living wage. None of National's policies directly acknowledge the reality on the ground, and none of them will make a meaningful positive difference for half the workforce. National talks about incentivizing people to work. This is politicians speak for cutting benefits and forcing people into grim working conditions. And the rationale is fair. If you pay people who don't work, you are paying them not to work. But that's only happening because half the wage earners are on the breadline and the dole is also the breadline. Capitalism is the core ethos of New Zealand society. The market is supposed to value all commodities, including human time. For those whose time is not valuable enough to sell for the basic necessities, we have the welfare state. If the welfare state, which supports people on the breadline, is competing with the labour market, then the labour market is where we need to focus our attention. It's not glamorous to be on the dole or on any benefit. Circling back to crime, a quarter of workers earn less than half of what is considered to be a living wage. This country is experiencing a massive increase in incidence of theft, and that rise in theft coincides with a huge increase in the cost of living. Crime and the weak labour market are very closely related problems. In its economic plan, National talks about driving technology and innovation, two areas usually associated with tertiary education. However, there is no mention of providing additional funding to universities in their education policy document. We have a massive tertiary education system subsidised by both government financial support of local students 
and foreign students who pay full fees that would be unaffordable to most people in New Zealand, earning New Zealand wages. Unfortunately, COVID shut down the foreign education industry, and that led to a massive drop in funding and, correspondingly, university staff layoffs. In spite of the foreign student flow recovering and some rescue funding provided by Labour, universities are planning to continue to lay off staff. This damage to these institutions is going to take many years to recover from. During that time, we're going to lose opportunities for research, both in the STEM subjects, which provides fuel for the innovation National so badly wants, and in the social sciences, which provide valuable research which we use for developing policies. Universities run studies like Growing Up in New Zealand, which follows the lives of about 7,000 children born between 2009 and 2010, and the Dunedin study, which did the same thing for children of the 70s. These enable us to understand our population. Without more of this research and the education that's produced alongside it, not only will the competence of our governing institutions suffer, but we won't develop the talent we need to grow and advance our economy. Terrible communication and a lack of cross-societal understanding is a big part of the backlash against co-governance, or tinoranga tiratanga. This is, from my limited understanding, basically the whole point of the Treaty of Waitangi. The history of the treaty is muddy, but it seems to be, to my unpracticed mind, a document signed in mutual good faith that was ultimately dishonoured by the Crown. That seems to be the mainstream view, and I don't want to litigate the treaty, but I do suggest that everyone read it. It's very short, and it does guarantee separate governance for Māori. Co-governance is not about racial segregation or creating a divided nation. It is, first and foremost, about honouring the treaty. The reason it makes sense as a policy option is that currently Māori are not treated equally by the providers of core governance services. A clear-cut example of European established systems failing Māori is the healthcare system. Māori have worse health outcomes than Europeans for the same medical issues, even after going to the doctor. And there tends to be poorer medical services in predominantly Māori communities. It is reasonable to say that there should be a separate health authority for Māori. The current one certainly isn't working. I'm not citing statistics because I haven't found any that illustrate the point as cleanly as I'd like. They take quite a bit of analysis and a fair treatment of the subject is beyond what I'm qualified to give. But as the Ministry of Health's anti-racism policy states, racism is increasingly recognised as a key determinant of health that results in avoidable and unfair disparities in health outcomes across racial or ethnic groups. Is a separate health authority the best solution to unequal health outcomes? I don't know. Probably not, to my conservative European eye. But on the other hand, you can't say it's a bad idea if you're not prepared to propose a serious alternative. On the other hand, who is one culture to say what is good for another, especially when that culture dishonors treaties and has to have an anti-racism policy for its healthcare system that's supposed to be guided by the Hippocratic Oath? Societies are supposed to be founded on the idea of a contract between the government and the governed. The government provides the services, the governed obey the law and pay taxes. That's the social contract. But governing multiple cultures under a single system is really hard. And in the case of our nation, it's not working. And strangely enough, this state of affairs was both anticipated by and provided for in the Treaty of Waitangi. It's fine to disagree with co-governance. There are many variations of it, some more strict than others, and there are risks in all implementations. However, whether someone agrees or not with the idea, their opinion should always be seated in a recognition of the reality on the ground. The European government's responsibility to all who live in this country, the broken contract that is the Treaty of Waitangi, the poor services provided to regions where Māori predominantly live, and the poor service Māori receive from public entities. There should also be an acknowledgement of the different areas where co-governance 
can be applied and what that looks like. The co-management of the Waikato River is an obvious one that has resulted in an improvement in the health of the resource. Before we move on, I want to recognise a few things. People of Pacifica and Asian ethnicities also experience substandard health treatment. Given that we're a nation that's supposed to be super diverse, it's pretty weird that non-Europeans have such a hard time of it. Also, grouping Māori as a single people is an idea that many consider to be of European origin. And I don't mean to downplay the identity of individual iwi. I understand the co-governance discussion as based on the concept of tino ranga tiratanga as it appears in the Treaty of Waitangi, which doesn't make provisions for individual iwi. This is an uncomfortable subject to talk about as a layman, especially as a European, largely because there's so much at stake and Europeans are so genuinely benefited by current society. But for us to move forward, we need to have these conversations and some treatments of the subject, like this one, are going to be naive and incomplete. We need to work toward resolution, and that means not sticking our heads in the sand and hand-waving these issues away and saying the past should be left in the past. Because for a lot of people, it's not the past. The financial, social, cultural, health, and emotional consequences of the breaches of the treaty continue to this day. Okay, the emissions trading scheme. This is going to be hard work. Uh, In 2008, we instituted this thing, uh, the Emissions Trading Scheme, also known as the ETS, in order to meet our obligations under the Kyoto Climate Protocol. The idea was that a carbon tax was a bit heavy-handed, and by creating a scheme that brought market forces to bear on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we could create an industry to solve the problem. Great market-driven idea. Love it. But the problem is, to build an industry around solving greenhouse gas emissions we need a somewhat predictable future price for carbon credits, or more accurately, New Zealand units, NZUs. These are the way that we measure greenhouse gas emissions and and we value their reduction. But the government has undermined this price predictability through repeated interventions. At the outset, the government set an emissions target of 10% below 1990 levels by 2020. Industries were going to be gradually included in the scheme, with forestry first to create an initial supply of carbon credits, and emissions of, and emitters over time, with agriculture entering the scheme last in 2013. This meant that someone who was planning to enter the New Zealand unit production market would be able to draw on the entirety of the New Zealand industrial base to sell their carbon credits to. Greenhouse gas emitters, which operated in export industries, were going to be allocated some free credits based on their expected production so that they could remain price competitive globally. A bunch of stuff got changed by the national government, though, the year, the next year, in 2009, which makes this pretty challenging for a non-expert to understand. Under their scheme, all participants were able to purchase an unlimited number of units from overseas and the government would offer an unlimited units for sale at the price of $25, which created a kind of price cap on how much an NZU could ever be worth. One emissions credit would have to be paid to the government for every two tonnes of carbon produced. This is kind of like a 50% discount. Export industry emitters would be allocated NZUs to cover between 60 and 90% of their emissions, and that was going to be phased out by 1.3% per year starting in 2013, and agricultural inclusion was pushed out to 2015. In March of 2011, an NZU on the open market was worth $21. Unfortunately, due to European mismanagement, in 2012 the market for foreign carbon credits crashed to $0.28. These are carbon credits that could be purchased in New Zealand to pay New Zealand carbon credit dues, and this destroyed the NZU market. To quote an unnamed 2012 market participant, I'm surprised people are not filling their boots. People seem to be having a tough time believing this market is credible. Against this backdrop, in 2012, new amendments were made to the ETS. Agriculture inclusion was made indefinite, as was the 50% free credits. 
Then in 2015, foreign credits were no longer accepted and New Zealand units were no longer allowed to, allowed to be sold overseas. In 2019, more changes were made in an amendment that included agricultural emissions in the scheme in 2030. So this whole story is very complicated and I definitely got some of it wrong. But that's in spite of a ton of research. So how then is someone supposed to build a business in this mess of a scheme? In June of this year, the Climate Change Commission said that it wasn't really working. Basically an admission that we don't have an effective greenhouse gas emissions reduction policy. The most important takeaway came from that quote in 2012. The market is not credible. Entrepreneurs expect the government to undermine it. This reality is beginning to rear its head again as the ETS has recently been reviewed and the national government is planning to make amendments that many expect to damage NZU producers and lower the costs of emitting greenhouse gases. In addition to the debacle of the scheme itself, there have been some negative un unintended consequences, like the use of agricultural pasture for the planting of permanent stands of radiata pine. This takes productive land and turns it into a monoculture of exotic forest that can never be cut down. It vandalizes the country and destroys the soil. So that's our climate policy. I don't mean to only focus on grim stuff. According to the 2021 General Social Survey, 78% of New Zealanders rated their happiness at better than 7 out of 10, and 37% said it was better than 9 out of 10, which is pretty awesome. We're a happy country. For many, things are going okay. Fish stocks are doing well, about three quarters are beating their population management targets. Aotearoa New Zealand is a wealthy country with very low debt and a healthy economy. Money can't solve everything, but it can solve a lot, especially if it's used efficiently. To reiterate, the reason I'm raising these issues is that I feel politicians are not discussing them in productive terms or effectively addressing them. They're framing problems in ways that will get them elected, but not in ways that will help us understand what we are electing them to solve. But things are happening. Behind the scenes, we have a good government in spite of what politicians like to say about each other in public. It's up to us, the voters, to set the agenda and put that government to work. A bit of housekeeping. This is a short pilot series, just four or five interviews. Subsequent series will be longer and more focused, but I'm just trying to get this off the ground and without live content, it's hard to get people to actually commit to doing interviews. And that means you can't get as good people. So the interviews aim to be poly policy focused, but in some cases they're just kind of so subject focused or just interesting, interesting stuff focused. At the end of the series, I'll produce a series wrap up that contains some key takeaways. I'll endeavor to make these interviews flow well, but I also edit quite aggressively so that there is sort of a trade off between flow and conversation and the density of information. Uh, some friends have asked why this is called Aotearoa tomorrow and not New Zealand tomorrow or something similar. I think New Zealand is a pretty cool country name because it has two words and a Z in it, but it was given to this country by an anonymous Dutch cartographer on the other side of the world. We're a nation of social innovators with our own culture or cultures and a potentially bright future that is ours to define. But if we want to prosper, we have to break from old ways of thinking and forge a new path that looks very different from the past 40 years. The reason that things have been the way for the past 40 years is actually an interesting subject of discussion in itself that I'm sure we'll cover eventually. New Zealand right now is stagnant. And for me, the name Aotearoa has always held a connotation of progress. I'm not saying that we should change the country's name but if it has two names, that's fine by me. Our first episode will feature sociologist Paul Spoonley of the Center for Informed Futures. Paul has a pretty illustrious career. He's a professor at Massey University and has published a ton of books. I got in touch to ask him about his work on social cohesion, a subject especially relevant to a country with two names. So look out for that next week. <sighs> Thanks for listening, guys. It's really, really hard to just sit and talk at a camera lens 
for ages. Um, uh, I've got a teleprompter here that's helping me kind of read notes as they go, but it does weird stuff to your eyes. And I mean, it's hard. I have a lot of respect for, um, for all the people on TV and on the news who do this stuff because it is not as easy as it looks. Um, but thanks for listening and I'll see you next week or whenever I get the next one out. Cheers.